Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our second to last panel of Made in NYC Week 2020. Uh, today's panel is uh, called Inclusive Design and Employment for People of All Abilities. Uh, we are really excited to put on this panel in partnership with Turnstile Tours. Uh, my name is Joanna Reynolds, and I am the manager of programs and partnerships for Made in NYC. Um, and for those who aren't as familiar, Made in NYC is a nonprofit local branding initiative that supports thousands of New York City's manufacturers and makers with marketing and branding su support and a sense of community, community building. Um, Made in NYC is an initiative of an organization called the Pratt Center for Community Development, which is a part of Pratt Institute. And Made in NYC Week is our time and our annual celebration of New York City's manufacturing and maker community. And this year, with everything that we've going on, it's more important now than ever to be celebrating and uplifting New York City, its communities and small businesses and its manufacturing community. Um, before we get started and I introduce uh, our, our moderator from Turnstile Tours who's running uh, t this today, I'm going to briefly thank our Meet in NYC Week sponsors. So I want to give a big thank you to the New York City Council who supports Meet in NYC's work all year round, as well as a thank you to Square, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Uncommon Goods, Goldman Sachs, Cozen O'Connor, Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center, Lisk NYC, TD Bank, Verizon, City Point, Adafruit, Taproom, Outsnapped, and Steady Goods. We are so thankful and appreciate your support to make what we do possible. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on Cindy Vandenbosch from Turnstile Tours, who's going to be bringing you an amazing panel today around inclusive design and employment for people for all abilities. So here we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I'm really looking forward to this program today. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, to introduce myself to those of you who are not familiar with Turnstile Tours, um, we are a social enterprise business that in normal times would be doing tours in partnership with different nonprofit organizations. Um, our mission as a company is to advance public knowledge about the meaning of place and connect people of diverse backgrounds. And we really, you know, normally do this through engaging in-person tours. And part of our mission is to make our experiences as accessible as possible to people of all backgrounds and abilities. Um, I myself have a background um, working in accessibility. So since 2003, in some way, shape or form, uh, I have worked to support especially cultural institutions in their efforts to more effectively engage the public and ensure that they are designing visitor experiences with people of all abilities, including people with disabilities in mind. And um, I am a certified accessibility professional. Uh, I have learned so much through the years working uh, with people who have disabilities, both apparent and non-apparent, uh, learning from the disability community, from the history of the disability rights community, uh, or the history of disability rights. Um, and uh, I'm so excited today uh, to bring this program uh, to everyone as part of Made in NYC Week. Uh, we're just so appreciative to have this opportunity to shine a light on the extraordinary work that uh, our guests are doing today to advance inclusion of people with disabilities, you know, both as makers and manufacturers as well. Some of them are businesses, some of them are organizations. And so we're gonna have the chance to learn from them um, and learn about the work that they're doing. Um, one other thing that I'd like to say is obviously when we say, um, you know, people with disabilities, that's that's a big tent. And that's that's gonna be most of us in our lifetimes. You know, according to the census, it's about 20% 
of the population in the United States self-identifies as having some sort of disability. But let's all remember that a disability, it can be temporary, it can be progressive, it can be non-apparent. For example, I grew up with epilepsy. Um, so it, it can be um, anything that is that maybe presents a person with challenges uh, accomplishing daily tasks. And so if you think of yourself or you think about the people you know, um, there's been instances where maybe someone has had trouble sleeping or standing or walking or speaking. Um, so there's a, it's a big tent, it's a broad range. I think how we'd like to approach the conversation today is really from the human rights angle that rather than focusing on sort of the individual and how they need to, how oftentimes they feel as though they need to adapt to uh, barriers that exist in our society. Uh, I'd rather take the view today where we think about it more from the human rights angle where we in our society can come up with ways to reduce whether it's physical barriers or attitudinal barriers so that everyone can participate and contribute their unique talents um, to our culture, to our society and to the workplace. And so um, without further ado, I would like to bring on our first guest and I should say everyone that we have joining us today is going to be speaking about inclusion and especially with respect to the manufacturing sector and to makers here in New York City. So we're just really looking forward to having all our guests on. Um, our, I, our guests will be, um, we're gonna start with Tamara Morgan. She's the Community Partnerships Coordinator from the Adaptive Design Association. Uh, after we speak with her, we'll speak with Sandra Alfonso, who's the founder and executive director of Adaptability, which is seeking to bring cycling to people of all abilities in New York City. Um, Suzanne Leary Shoemaker, who's the founder and CEO of Undercare, uh, and they're doing work in adaptive undergarments. Uh, and swimsuits, so we'll get to learn about that. And last but not least, Karen Waltuck is joining us. She's the director of the Customized Employment Consortium, which is a project of Job Path NYC, and she'll be speaking with us about her program and the benefits that it has really to employers in terms of retaining skilled people with developmental disabilities as employees. Um, so now I'd like to welcome on Tamara Morgan. Um, she's the Community Partnerships Coordinator at the Adaptive Design Association. Um, Tamara, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good afternoon, Cindy. Thank you so much to Made in NYC and Turnstile Tours and all of the other organizations and businesses on the line with us today. I'm delighted to be here representing Adaptive Design, also known as ADA, um, and I'm ready to answer all your questions that you might have for us. Yes, thank you so much. And I should mention, thank you, Tamara. That's right. So if people do have questions for us, please uh, include them in, in the chat and we'll do our best to address those as we go along today. Um, but I have a question for you. So can you introduce us a little bit to the work of the Adaptive Design Association? You know, what do you do? How was the organization founded? And specifically, Tamara, how did you get involved? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so Adaptive Design, we are a nonprofit organization located in Midtown Manhattan. We have been in existence since about 1998, um, where our founder and fabrication director, Antoinette Lasoisa, started the organization to support people with custom adaptation needs. So anything that you can't really find commercially in a catalog that you can't necessarily get a prescription for, we often say our work starts where the catalog ends. And for me, I am a person with a disability. I have osteogenesis imperfecta, also known as brittle bone disease. Um, and I use a motorized wheelchair as my main means of getting around, which you can kind of see behind me there. Um, and I got connected with ADA in, I want to say 2006, when I needed my own custom adaptation. I was a undergrad student at a, a college in New York City. Um, and I was traveling about New York City and realizing that so many people, vehicles, 
and the likes did not see me traveling about. And because of my bone condition, I could get severely hurt if someone knocked into me by accident. So I was trying everything on my own to make myself more visible, but it really did not work. <laughs> um, and to think I've used a wheelchair my entire life, but I never had anything on it or placed on it or considered to be on it to make me more visible. And within, I want to say two to three months of being connected with adaptive design, um, I was given a wheelchair light lamp, um, which stands tall above my chair that makes me much more visible. And instantaneously, really, my, my life felt changed and I felt much safer in traveling. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. And you also have a background in mental health as well. Isn't that right? Very true. <laughs> yes. So I want to say um, at Disaptive Design, we are a melting pot of different uh, disciplines and fields. So I joined the team from a mental health background because I realized that we were giving people so much agency, so much independence, so much contribution through adaptations that I felt the reward honestly was just as great as when I was working in the mental health field. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that background um, plays an important role in the work that you do with so many individuals. Um, so you work with both children and adults to create custom adaptations, and maybe it would help folks if we show some examples and you can talk us through um, examples of projects that you've worked on to adapt uh, standard design products to make them more accessible to the individuals you've worked with. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Okay, so let's see here. Alrighty, um, thank you for presenting the slide, Cindy. Um, so as Cindy shared, we often start where the catalog ends. And so many times there may be a commercial item that is given to someone who has a disability, but it may not be made specifically for that individual to use on their own without the proper modifications. So in this picture here, we can see Joshua. Joshua is a young boy with spina bifida who is given a foot cycle to use mm -hmm. as exercise at home to get his legs moving having that mobility and muscle development however he had no way to use it at home it's actually quite heavy um, and a little cumbersome for him to maneuver on his own so he his grandma and his social worker who you see in the back there came to us hoping that we could come up with a solution with them so our fabrication team, a bunch of interns, and a bunch of volunteers worked with Joshua and his family for over a few weeks, really, to create a custom chair that could house his foot cycle as well as be used for like other activities as well. So he doesn't always have to be sitting in his wheelchair. He can sit in other places. When we think about it, we change our positioning so many times during the day, but we don't often think about that for people who use uh, other mobility devices. So here you see Joshua in another fitting, testing out, could he use a keyboard while also sitting in his custom chair? And one thing that I think is so interesting is with many of your projects, you're, and it's it's definitely the case here, you're using cardboard, yes, which is an absolutely. affordable material. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We build with locally resourceable materials. So that's anything from cardboard to Elmer's glue to wooden nails to yoga mat for cushioning um, to brown paper bag for edging the corrugated uh, sections of the cardboard to keep it safe and strong. Um, so really, we feel that by using locally resourceable materials, we are not presenting an inhibition for people to to make. So if you're not able to access a wood or a plastic or some other costly material, you can build with what you have. 
and here Joshua is displaying his chair in uh, Senility there. Um, so it was quite a bit of a project. It took many hands and many minds to create it, but he is happily now able to use his foot cycle and also use it in other instances where you see him here using it at his computer desk. Okay, here we have another student, uh, a high school student, uh, who we met in a local school. Um, his name is Lewis, and Lewis has on his wheelchair there a communication device that helps him communicate because he's not able to use his verbal voice to communicate. Um, however, because he had a rather heavy, um, big uh, acrylic tray on his chair, he was not able to have his custom uh, communication device on it and the tray at the same time. So he would often have to choose whether he was able to communicate or participate in an activity. And that doesn't really make much sense, right? So when we met with Lewis and his paraprofessional and teacher, we were able to come up with a design that just with a simple cutaway for the bar of his communication device, he could have both. He could have his communication device and his tray because he shouldn't have to choose between communicating and contributing. I just I think about that. Is this a is this a standard design where people who use communication devices would have to choose between, let's say, art making and communicating? Um, is that a, is that a common thing? Honestly, it really is because what happens is with many commercially available devices companies, they don't often meet the individual who they are making for. So everything is built in custom generalized sizes, big, small, medium. Um, and so they would not necessarily be taking into consideration Lewis's need for the tray and his communication device. And that is what I think sets adaptive design apart from many other businesses um, that create adaptations because we are making the adaptation with the user in mind from start to finish. There is no time where they are not involved in the building process. And I understand that you not only work with the individual, but oftentimes it's a whole team of people so that you have buy-in um, across the board, whether it's the parents or spouse or um, therapists, doctors, etc. Yes, absolutely. I, th I think the reason that we have such a collaborative um, way in which we work is because if everyone is not involved and everyone's voices is not heard, oftentimes that adaptation will not be used. And we we don't want that. We want it to be used. We want the individual to have the most access uh, to contribute in any way that they see fit for that that adaptation. Um, and if everyone isn't involved, then it might just end up in a storage closet somewhere, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, so here in this picture, we have a teenage girl named Hannah. Um, and on the left-hand side there, we are seeing a sketch of uh, different switches that Hannah will use to actually maneuver her motorized wheelchair. So because of Hannah's disability, uh, grabbing onto a traditional joystick is a little bit too difficult for her. But if she has the uh, switch access right on her train, there, she can just briefly uh, press her hand across while also working on like range of motion at the same time. She'll be able to maneuver her chair independently and she wouldn't need someone to push her. She can do it on her own. And that in independence is so important for the work that you're doing. Absolutely, it's critical. And here we see Hannah again uh, with her custom switch uh, 
I want to say maneuvering joystick uh, on her motorized wheelchair. But Hannah is like many of the people that we work with in that when we create something, one thing, we often think of so many other things that could be adapted because your environment doesn't have to stay fixed. It can change. It could be changed so that it's accustomed to what you need. And so here on the right hand side, I believe Hannah might have been six in this picture is when we first met her and her mom wanted her to be able to move around the house like all of her other siblings. And so we created a custom scooter so that she could do it. Uh, the middle piece there might be, um, you know, just a commercial, um, how do you say, steering wheel, but the other part of the seat is custom built for, for Hannah. Ah, okay, so here we have a little one named Grace and her therapist there. So Grace and her therapist came to us because they wanted Grace to be able to work on sitting independently, being able to access toys on her own without the aid of uh, mom or dad or the therapist or sibling. Um, so again, talking about agency and choice, um, we created a custom floor seat sitter for Grace where she's able to sit on her own. There she is, sit on her own um, and reach the floor and reach anything within her reach there so that she can play, so that she can communicate and socialize. And so if she didn't have this floor sitter, she would have to be held. Um, and so, you know, wherever whomever is holding her wants to move, then that's where they will move. But here, Grace has the choice to be where she wants to be. Um, and she's very happy in that picture. And I'm assuming that she takes after someone of my own heart that loves pinks and purples. And so it is designed uh, with her in mind there. Well, thank you so much. This has been uh, so interesting learning about the work you do. If people want to get in touch, you work with children, but you also work with adults. Um, if there's something in their environment that isn't working for them and they need an adaptation, uh, how might they get in touch with you? And then also how can people support the work that you're doing? Absolutely. So you may reach us at info at adaptivedesign.org. That, that is our main email address. Um, so once you email that, we will all get the, the message and we can follow up with you. Or you can follow us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, or just give us a call as well. Um, we will be happy to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara. This has been really interesting. And at the very end, we're going to welcome back all of our speakers to field questions from um, the audience. Um, but I, I would now, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And now I'd thank like you. to invite um, Sandra Alfonso, who is the founder and executive director of Adaptability, which is also a nonprofit organization that specializes specifically in making bicycling and cycling accessible to people with disabilities. Um, Sandra, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I just, I know that you ran a, a bicycle repair shop uh, pretty close to actually where I live in Brooklyn um, for, for several years. And that that led you into eventually starting this nonprofit you know, really using your skills to make cycling accessible to all people. Can you tell us a little bit about that story, how you made that transition? Sure. First of all, thank you, Cindy, for having me. And thank you, Made in AYC, to, for this great thing that we're doing today to communicate with people and to give information about opportunities for people with disabilities. So I've been in the bicycle industry for almost 25 years. And six years ago, I opened my own um, bicycle store behind bars in Brooklyn. Um, we only did repairs. Um, we had the concept that we want to recycle everything that people had. So we want to keep using the same things that we have. And three years ago, I had the best experience of my life when I saw a child in a 
bicycle, just riding with his father. And next to him was a child in a wheelchair. And the, just to see the face of the child in the wheelchair and the wishes that he can do that made me decide that I want to change the life of people with disability and children with special needs. And I decided that I was going to convert my store just to make things accessible for people so everybody can enjoy the ride of having a bicycle and see the world in a different way. Because when you are on a bicycle, you see everything in a different way. I, it's so incredible because you you realized, wait a second, I have these skills as a bicycle me mechanic. I can adapt standard bicycles. I can change them. Um, and so it's it's such an interesting sort of application that you realize you have the skill set. Here's here's your old here's the shop that you used to have. Um, and uh, and then you started advertising on the outside of your shop adaptability and um, people started to come in. Um, can you share uh, you know, some examples of uh, simple and affordable solutions? We have some photos here that we can look at together of how you've adapted bicycles. Sure, so one of the things why we use our front of the store to promote adaptability, it's because like Tamara said before, um, when people purchase things for most of the times for people with disabilities, most of the things are made, but they're not customized. It. And people have maybe the same disability, but because of our bodies and because they react in a different way, people need customization. So we want people to know that we were doing that for them. So in this picture, you can see that we are adapting just a regular basket that you can see on bicycles that people are doing deliveries all the time and we just customize it and we put it in this bicycle that is going to be used um, to a girl that she just had pneumonia and she well she used a wheelchair all the time but she just had pneumonia and now she has to use an oxygen tank and when we gave him this bicycle um, it was great but now we were having the problem that she wasn't going to she couldn't use the bicycle anymore because now she has this tank that she has to carry all the time. So we reach out to the company to see, you know, if we can, if we can adapt a basket to it. But the price to get a basket adapt to it was almost 10 times what we really pay just using just a regular basket. And that's what we are all into. We want to do things with the things that we have so it can be more affordable so people can use the bikes. We, are, we had a lot of things. We had to put a lot of things on regular bicycles, just customizing it just with what we have because we can do that. That's yeah, and it's it's an oxygen tank, right? So just to accommodate this oxygen tank, um, it would have been extremely expensive to pay for the, ba the other basket, whereas you found an affordable basket and were able to do this. Um, yeah, well, less than seventy-five dollars. We just did a basket that maybe would have cost four hundred dollars. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing! That's amazing. And here you can see how we took it um, for the ride to be sure that everything fit and that the cables for the oxygen tank were not in the middle you know, bothering her or can be broken because of the pedal stroke or anything like that. So we we took it for a spin to see. And that's something that we do. Um, every child or every adult that receive a bicycle from us, we just continue. We are making, I think that we are creating a big family and we go and we check on them. We wanted to be sure that the bicycle is correct, that the adaptation that we did to the bicycle is still fit them properly because, you know, we get a little bit older or and we, our body change. So we always need customization on it. Oh, that's great. That's great. And here we have an example of um, working on um, foot pedals. So, so what's happening here with this adaptation? Yes, so this child, when he received the bicycle, he used to um, pedal. So if you see at the bottom that you see on the floor, those were the pedals that he was using, but um, his legs are giving up a little bit, so we don't want him to be without mobility. So now he's using a hand cycle. We adapt something to the bicycle so he can pedal with his hands, but we needed to have something so where he put his feet, because if not, there will be just be tangling in there. 
So we just created this platform that they put their feet and they don't move. They just rest in there without mobility. So they he's always have his feet on place. And we can see here uh, some of the work that you're doing to take a standard. Is this a standard sized pedal that you're? Yeah, this is a platform. And what we do, we would just, we customize it to the size of the child, of the individual, of the adult. Um, just like was said before, we do um, spend a lot of time with the family. We talk to the doctors, the physical therapists to get all the input, just to make everything as perfect as we can so they can enjoy the ride and that they really get the mobility that is meant to have. Because even that they have fun on the bicycle, one of the things that we are promoting this is because we want people to get mobility and to change, just like Tamara says, just to get another way to move around those so they will not always be on the wheelchair. So in here, the child had a foot that it was bigger than the other. So we were just customizing to just so both feet can look the same. And here we have an example uh, of an, a, a, the, your first, the first bicycle that you worked on for an adult. That's correct. Um, this bicycle was given to us. We take donations um, and then we take those donations and we just adapt it to what we needed. And this is, he became our friend. His, his name is George and he's here. Um, he has a mess and his legs are a little bit tight, um, but we want him to get mobility. So we are we gave him a hand cycle, but we needed to extend the bottom part of the bicycle because his legs cannot be bent. They need to be straight all the time. Is the his legs are bent, it's really hard for him to bring them back to any other position. So what we did is we extended the bicycle, we make it longer so he can extend his legs and it will be easier for him to just pedal with the hands. And here he is in the park enjoying a ride. Um, this is this is so great. I mean, the uh, you're a relatively young, uh, new nonprofit organization in New York City, um, and I'm just curious to hear like what are some of what what's to come? What is some of some of the exciting activities that you have coming up? Um, things that you're looking forward to um, with the work that you're doing. So we are very excited because even though we closed our store that it was in 17 and Fifth Avenue. We are moving to a new location. We are going to be in Brooklyn Army Terminal on the second floor in the Annex building. So we are very excited. Our space is much bigger. So we will have more space to do adaptation. And we are so proud and so happy to announce that we will be hiring people. And we are hoping that 90% of our new employees will be people with disabilities. Oh, that's that's wonderful, and it's really exciting news that you have this new space, brand new space, um, for you um, to continue to build build community. Um, if people would like to get involved with your organization, do you take volunteers? And also, um, you know, is if if people need to have a bicycle adapted, or they're looking for straps or they're looking for practical solutions? Um, do they just find you through your website? Sure. So one of the things that I want to mention that I think that is very important is that when we talk about adaptability, we always talk a bicycle for every child. So we don't want to miss any child in our program. So what we do is we do take donations for just regular bikes. And when the child grow up and the parents don't need the bicycle, we take those donations and we fix those bicycles and we have it in our facilities for free for kids. So any parent that need a bicycle for the child, they can contact us and get a free bicycle. And they can contact us, um, they can call us and they can come to our new facility. It's like 80 and 58th Street in Sunset Park. And they can go to our website and they can apply for our services. We donate bicycles so they can fill up our application. And our website is adaptabilitybike.org. Or they can send us an email at believe at adaptabilitybike.org. 
and it will be our pleasure to help anybody. That's great. That's great. Thank you. And I mean, that's something that you realize being in New York City, not everyone has space for their own bicycle. Uh, and so you're providing this important service as you continue to expand um, where you're able to, to still ride a bike, um, but access it through you um, on, on loan. And I think that's that's absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for sharing your story. I think it's, it's, it's so interesting that you have this aha moment, being a, having the bicycle repair skills and knowing that you could apply it in this way. Um, and so we're just really excited to see um, how your organization evolves in the coming years ahead. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so we now are going to shift gears. We've we've met with a couple of um, leaders of nonprofit organizations that have focused on adaptive design, taking standard products and finding creative ways to make them usable and functional for people that have different abilities and different needs. Um, now we're gonna interview a woman who was an artist by training and who, who also had this moment where she realized that she could create an adaptive garment that would make a big difference in people's lives. And so um, without further ado, I'd like to invite on uh, Suzanne Leary Shoemaker, who's the CEO and founder of Undercare. Um, Suzanne, welcome to, welcome to the program. Can you show, share a little bit more about your founding story and um, yeah. what the moment was that, that sparked the idea of becoming an entrepreneur? Yes, sure. I'd be happy to. And thanks for having me. And I'm so excited about everything that everybody's doing. Um, yes, I'm trained as an artist. Um, I had a very traditional training where I, which was figurative based. So part of my training was to learn all the bones and muscles in the human body. Um, so one day I was swimming at the YMCA in White Plains, New York. And after swimming, I I happened to observe some elderly women who were struggling to dress following their swimming class for their arthritis. And I was very struck by how determined they were to self-dress, but also I was aware of the difficulty they were having. So they were using these um, things called grabby sticks, um, which I'm sure you've seen them. It's like a pole with a pincer on the end. And they were dangling their underwear and trying to thread their feet and legs through this leg opening. And so as I was watching them, I thought, you know, there must be a better way to get dressed, an easier way to get dressed. So that was my aha moment. And I went home and I started cutting and sewing together undergarments to try to come up with an easier um, design. So I really basically was just taking an everyday object and redesigning it. And, you know, really, people have been wearing undergarments since Adam and Eve, um, and underwear has changed a great deal over the years, but what hasn't changed is how people put them on, right? So I came up with a new way to do this. And so um, at first, I had designed undergarments, you know, by a woman for women, but it didn't take me long to realize that the design could be useful to men, children. Um, so I've expanded the line bit by bit. Um, and so my background is I'm a creative, um, and I like the creative part, but so have I, so I had my idea, my good idea, but then from getting from that into production, there were a lot of steps in between. So from concept to commercialization, many, many steps in between. So I, um, had to teach myself to become a businesswoman. I had to learn about corporate structure um, and business. Um, and I also had to learn about the fashion industry in New York and how that works. I had to find a manufacturer. And then I had to think about marketing the product, which um, is you know, e-commerce, having a website, um, how, to, how I wanted to position my products, who was my target. Um, the language around disability. I mean, my learning curve was very steep, but there's a lot of help out there for entrepreneurs. And also when I first started there really, I didn't even know the word adaptive clothing. It really was not in common use in 2011. Um, and so really my timing was just serendipitous because 
uh, there's just been an explosion in awareness. Um, about, I'm reading the text. It's so funny. The, the text I'm trying to read. I shouldn't read it. Um, so there's yes. Yeah, so there's much more emphasis and focus on inclusion, um, diversity, and uh, you know there's a nice intersectionality of disability with diversity and inclusion, right? So um, I'm really happy to be part of that. Um, so basically, what you're looking at is um, uh, somebody putting on the undergarments. Um, when I first designed it, I used snap fasteners um, to attach the fabric and I used a snap buckle in the middle. But I realized that that is, involves a lot of manual dexterity. And I was talking to the VA um, because actually there's a lot of veterans who have a lot of limb uh, problems, right? I mean, in Vietnam, it was mainly spinal cord injury, but Iraq and Afghanistan, um, it, there's a lot of limb uh, impairment. So I, the good news is, is there's a lot of rehabilitation that can be done. The bad news is, is that there's a lot of it. But anyway, um, so the VA actually said, you know, we really think you should think about using Velcro closures. So um, regular Velcro, when you say the word Velcro and people think about, you know, this horrible scratchy stuff, which, um, you know, does its job, but it's not really what you want to have next to your soft skin or on your undergarments. So through a lot of research, I found this specialty Velcro. Um, it is a Velcro brand product, and it's something that's used on baby fetal monitors. So we know that it's safe to be next to, it's hygienic and it's safe to, and soft enough to be um, next to soft skin. Um, so that is the kind of Velcro that we use. Um, and so we, we have briefs, we have boxers, and now we've moved into bathing suits. So, so I guess you can see that you attach it first in the middle and then you pull the panel, which would hang down in the back. You pull the panel through to the front and attach on the right and left sides. And once on, you can uh, pull up or pull down the undergarment at one piece. Um, so, we are now expanding the line um, to include bathing suits, and we're looking at, you know, we're really interested in things like magnetic fasteners, but we've all, we've found also, um, we're really excited about, I want to show you uh, this zipper. This is what's oh. called a one-handed zipper. Um, Suzanne, it. Suzanne, um, if, if I can ask uh, our folks behind the scenes who are producing, if it's possible uh, I'm going to turn off my camera so we can make you in a bigger screen and we'll make the, so that way the slideshow will be like sort of a little window so we can see you in full view okay. in the product. Um, so I'm going to stop my camera. All right. Okay. Now, is that better? I'm still seeing the picture. There I am. Is and is it? I'm gonna oh, mute hi. myself while you. I'm gonna mute myself while you're doing a demo, okay. so hopefully we can see the the slide right. as well. So here is an example of some innovation. I did not design this magnetic zipper, but it's something that we found out there, and we are using. We're integrating it into our design. So this is called a one-handed zipper, and um, often people, you know, would have a hard time connecting a zipper at the bottom. But this, you just hold it this close and it just snaps together like that. It's amazing. And then you can just zip up the zipper. Um, so this is what we're using on our men's board short um, that it will fasten on the sides with the magnetic zipper. We also have, um, yeah, so you've seen the picture of the women's brief. And we have a men's brief. And we have boxers, all which work the same way. I guess this probably, I don't know how clear this is, but I'll do my best here. So this here is the, the, the boxer. And then this is gonna be a little tricky to show, but here is a bathing suit, which 
has the same design feature of being able, you don't have to pull it over your feet and legs to put it on. You're able to zip up the front, center front, and then reach under the skirt and pull the panel through your legs and attach on the right and left side. So it makes getting into and out of a bathing suit very easy for anybody who might have an issue with balance or some people just have trouble because they take medications that make bending over and coming up uh, makes them dizzy. Um, so we're also doing a line of athletic shorts too that work the same way. So that's, that's what we're working on. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, it's, it's such interesting design work that you're doing here. We also have a schematic here that I think is really, it's very interesting. So what, what is the design that we're seeing here in the schematic? Yeah, so it, this is three different versions of the product. We have the men's brief, the women's brief, and the boxer, the three lines. And basically what the way you put on the undergarment is it opens up to look like an hourglass. That's how I describe it. So if you look in visual number one, and then you take the two ends and you wrap it around your waist like a belt and you attach it um, in, at, at your center waist. And then you have the panel, which would be ha hanging down the back and you pull that through your legs and then you attach on the right and left sides. So that's how the men's brief works. That's how the women's brief works. And that's also how the boxer works. And I, I mean, in terms of um, markets, you know, obviously you're thinking about your target audiences. Which markets are you reaching or which do you hope to reach with these products? Well, the products are helpful to people with temporary, um, like maybe a broken leg or um, in, if you have a, a hard, long cast on your leg, you can't really put on your underwear or progressive um, MS, Parkinson's, or a permanent disability like um, prosthesis or, um, you know, um, so, uh, and then we really span the entire age spectrum. I mean, if you have a child, um, I don't know, here's another example, somebody with um, severe burning, you could, um, you know, it's a way for a child to be able to self-dress which is very empowering and a, a wonderful thing for a child to be able to do. That's under care is all about independence and dignity and self-dressing. Um, so, uh, but, but it, we span all the way through to aging people, right? So we're not an incontinence product, although we're easily adaptable to incontinence product to become, to using incontinence products. But, um, so, but we span, you know, from, I don't know, childhood through um, old age. That's, it's, it's really true. You can see where there's uh, many people would benefit from um, these designs that you've so creatively come up with. Um, since it's made in NYC week and you've started a business really from soup to nuts in the fashion industry and in what I kind of consider as a new category, um, could you tell us a little bit about sort of sourcing from the businesses in New York to produce samples and, um, you know, maybe challenges or opportunities you've faced in bringing adaptive clothing to the market in the fashion industry in the way that it's structured? Are there specific yeah. kind of challenges you've faced yeah. in navigating that um, that you'd be willing to share with us? Yes, of course. So, you know, first of all, you have the idea and you come up with a, a working prototype or a working sample, but you need to formalize that. And the process of formalizing that and getting into production, there are many, many steps in the way. And I was looking at a schematic, which it, it actually has 20, 20 steps along the way. So um, there's so many aspects to it. And um, you have to understand, you have to learn about fabrication. You have to learn about, um, and what fabrics um, do you want to use and why do you want to use them? You have to learn about shrinkage. You have to learn about fabric weight. Um, then you have to learn about making the sample and how to, so this is called grading. So you make a sample size, usually a medium, 
and you fit that onto a medium sized body and that's your, your sample size. And you always wanna go back to that same sample size because that's your sample size for your brand. But then it's not quite like Microsoft Word where things get larger or smaller um, uh, vertically and horizontally. Um, so what you have to do is you have to like figure that out. And so you also have to figure out how much, how many inches are going to be between each size. So between a small, some brands, between a small and a medium, you might have a two inch increase in waist size. One brand might prefer to have a three inch. So those are just the particular things about your particular brand and you take into account who your target is, right? Who, um, okay, so then you get your sample made and you start to figure out your grading rules. And then you need to find a factory, which for me was really the hardest thing to find a reliable factory. And you don't just, so, not every factory will just take you on. You have to get on to the queue. You have to be picked by them. They have to believe in your brand. And what they're looking for is repeat business. So even having one product really might not get you a, a factory. So you have to find out about factories. Then you need to vet the factory because you want to make sure that you're using a factory that has sustainable practices, that has um, really good employment practices um, that doesn't have children working in it that empowers women. Um, so, so that whole part is is you know take time consuming and, and very very important um, for part of your for your branding. It's who you are as a brand, what you believe in, and you want to be able to say that you ethically manufacture your products. Um, in all honesty, right. So then once you find the factory, then you have to go through a process of having the uh, sample approved, sample approval process. Then you have to figure out your size ratios, how many you're going to make of each size. Then you have to figure out costing, pricing, um, is shipping included, um, how to price it properly. Are you going to, do you want to be a luxury brand or do you want to be an everyday brand? Where do you see your product? Um, and then, you know, as somebody explained to me, it's kind of like, well, you want to be able to make a profit, right? But you also have to be able to find people. So you could have the, a five-star restaurant in the middle of Alaska and nobody would go, right? So you, you need to be able to find a way to get out there so that people know of your existence and they know where you are and they can find you. And so... All of these are things that <laughs> I try to work on <laughs> every day. And um, yeah, so that's that's what we're doing here. Steep, steep learning curve when you're an entrepreneur, for sure, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. um, so what if, what is next? Like as you look to the future, um, is the is it the bathing suit is kind of your newest endeavor and, and sort of what's what's coming what's coming up next for undercare? I am really excited about the bathing suits. I really like the um, athletic wear as well, because we really love a lot of the stuff that's going on with adaptive sporting. Um, it's so wonderful for people with disability to be involved in adaptive sporting for lots of reasons. Um, so I'm excited about those two parts of the business. Um, I'm also excited to be working and trying to learn about this whole marketing thing and social media and Instagram and um, who we are and um, who we're trying to reach and how to find them. And <laughs> so that's what's next. Well, thank you, Suzanne. It was such a pleasure to have you have you on the program. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and if people want to find uh, undercare or place an order, you can go to undercare.com and you can also find them on social media at undercare Inc. I believe it is your, your handle. Yes. Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not too hard to find. <laughs> um, well, thank, thank you so much. Um, you. Susanna, we'll bring you back right at the end when we have everyone come back. Um, but I'd like to introduce, uh, last but not least, um, our, uh, you know, 
October is uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month, um, which every month should be. Um, but we are excited and uh, honored to have Karen Waltuck, who is uh, the director of the Consortium for Customized Employment at Job Path NYC, uh, join us from, uh, from the program to share a little bit with us about how employers in the manufacturing sector can create more inclusive and competitive work environments. And so, Karen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I guess to kick things off, tell us a little bit about what you're doing, uh, what is customized employment, and uh, how does it work? Oh, we can hear you. You can unmute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy and um, Pratt, for this. You know, for this entire Made in New York uh, week, it's really exciting and and very inspiring to hear everyone today. Um, for uh, you know, all these adaptive designs, it's a new world. It's fantastic. And um, so, what we do. Um, Job Path actually had uh, started about 40 years ago um, in the Vera, a pilot program from the Vera Institute of Justice, um, focusing on uh, long term employment for people with developmental disabilities. And um, about eight years ago, um, they had a decided to launch this initiative that was for all these agencies, were 14 agencies in the consortium, to collaborate together to work under this new strategy called customized employment. These are all the agencies, nonprofits that are part of the consortium. And what we really do, what customized employment is uh, partnering with business to collect, connect to this incredible untapped uh, skilled workforce. Um, so really we're a talent resource for business. Uh, and the uh, point of departure is, is to focus on uh, really a specialized exploration of a specific employer's needs. So the place, the point of departure is what does any particular employer need done? Uh, when do they need it done? What task it is? Um, where, what is the environment? What is the culture? Uh, uh, and we're specifically task-based. So it wouldn't be, let's say, a renaissance position of an individual that would both enter data and answer the phones. It would be more um, a specific task, perhaps a particular piece of a machinery that needs to be made in a, in a very um, uh, particular way or someone that would always be greeting individuals. So we, we're we looking in a task-based um, Format And then apart from that, separately, um, and we invest a lot of time in the back end, we come to know each individual job seeker. So um, because a person with a developmental disability, if you've met one person with a developmental disability, you've met one person with a developmental disability. This is not a similar adaptive where, you know, you're um, – uh, have access for an individual with a, with a wheelchair. Um, it's a developmental disability. And so we want to know about that specific person as, as formally and as clearly as we want to know what needs to be done for a business. Um, and so what we do is when we know those two pieces, uh, we can land a perfect match. So um, it could be bookkeeping. It could be shipping and packing, it could be maintenance, it could be, I mean, a person, the skills are soup to nuts. And um, and that's really what customized employment is. It's knowing exactly the need of an, indivi of an individual business and knowing our job seekers and seeing how they really do intersect at that perfect place. It could be a two hour job, it could be full time, um, but, uh, the key is really understanding the real needs of a business. It's not an altruistic exercise here, because I think that a lot of businesses are interested in, you know, really making a difference because, and disability is a social justice issue. Uh, and there's a lot going on right now in social justice, which I'm um, optimistic about actually. 
um, but um, it's it's making a long term match. So we take a lot of time up front, and we want this to last. And actually, our numbers are far better than in the general population. Um, customized employment um, is eighty percent for uh, long term employment. That's over a year. That's far better than the general population. And um, so you know, it's financially advantageous for a business. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, that's, it addresses high turnover, it addresses tasks that need to be done by others um, to free someone up uh, for them to do the job they've been engaged to do at perhaps a much higher pay grade. Um, it's good for crunch times, for, um, you know, running lean. Um, and I think it, in many ways, although I work with larger businesses too, that may be like universities or whatever, I think in a certain sense, working with small businesses have been a sweet spot for us because you want to work directly with day-to-day -day management. You want to work with someone that can really see what's going on, where is, is someone useful. Mostly part-time is what we like to our, many of our individuals come have their own benefits. Um, so that can be very financially advantageous to a business too. But um, a business that wants to stay nimble um, and can um, not over or understaff, you know, those are really our sweet spots where we think we can make the most, um, uh, you know, be the most effective in a, in a business. So um, I can go on and on. I'm not sure where you want me to go. <laughs> The, the whole thing about uh, it, it being a good partnership when you work with a small business is excellent for the manufacturing industry, especially in an urban place like New York City, where so many of the, you know, we give tours at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and we see a majority of those businesses are have about 10 employees or so. So mm -hmm. it's seems like it's a pretty good match. I did want to ask you um, about these uh, logos that we see on the screen. We see organizations like Birch Family Services and AHRC and Job Path, of course, as well as uh, several other organizations. Um, you have a whole consortium that's working together to create this pool of talent, um, and you're sort of coordinating with one another. Could you tell us a little more about how you're doing that, what the consortium really sure. is. I think you have a picture of what the customized employment piece is, but maybe the consortium side of things. Right, for the consortium, I mean, I think um, there's really two parts to my position. The one piece uh, for the consortium is for us all to be, instead of competitive, to be working together for as many placements as possible for people with developmental disabilities. So actually half my job, which doesn't really affect um, businesses per se, is for us to mentor these agencies in specifically in customized employment, um, which is takes a lot of time in the front end. So the consortium itself and the individuals that are coming through there that I'm making matches for, we have no number goals. Um, where many of these organizations in different parts of their agencies, um, well, they also, many of them have residential things. We're, we're actually working um, in small areas of each of these agencies that are particularly interested in this um, strategy of, of customized employment, where you've come to know the individual, you know, from the beginning really thoroughly, where you can meet the um, employer and, drill down into exactly what they need, when they want to do it, go and see the environment, you know, what is the culture of the business, et cetera, and then make a match. So we have roundtables monthly, we have trainings in specifically in this um, strategy that actually came out of Mississippi um, uh, that we've been working with about for about 10 years and Job Path itself actually changed all its programs to customize employment. Um, it's, you know, is a very forward thinking um, strategy that, as I say, again, is very much more time consuming for the agency. So we're collaborating. Um, we have this much larger gene pool that way. It's not just job path. So that if I find a need from an employer that perhaps one of these agencies does not have a perfect match for, where since we're collaborating and we can all be working together, we can look to see where is that perfect match 
for the business, you know, so. So half my job is mentoring and half my job is really reaching out and making um, relationships, long-term relationships with businesses. Um, well, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say it's so helpful too, I think, to hear people's stories and the stories of employers that have participated in this customized employment approach. Um, and you have a few examples that you can share with us today of the different kinds of jobs or tasks um, that employers have um, partnered up with JobPath to, to fulfill through your program. And so if you could share a few of those with us. Sure. That would um, so this is Guillermo. Um, and he's, as you can see, he's a very personal, personable individual, very um, feisty and uh, engaging. Um, and um, he's, you know, he can do a lot of different things. Um, he's, he loves to clean um, and he loves to make food at home. And so he, um, we matched him with Panera. Um, and actually we have other positions that are similar. We were collaborating a, a lot with Shake Shack. Um, for just hospitality champs because they're very um, person-centered um, for their clients. Um, so Guillermo is working at Panera and he's um, very much in contact with the uh, individual, you know, with customers there and, you know, he preps and, you know, serves coffee, um, which isn't quite manufacturing, but I wanted you to see a little bit more of the breadth of individuals that we engage. So this is James. Um, James um, lives way the heck out in Brooklyn and wanted something in his area. He actually had a particular um, emotional attachment to the poly prep because his brother, who is not a person with a disability, had actually gone there. And so um, we had explored um, working with them. At the outset, they really just needed, he wanted to work full time, but at the outset, they really just needed someone to update, charge and update their computers, which they give to all their students. And, um, but it became really obvious that he had so many more talents. And so he's actually shared now by many, many departments in the school. Um, he works in the administrative office. He works with uh, Bursar. He works with um, the science, rooms to organize um, them afterwards, just administrative stuff. And um, yeah, he's, he's kind of a Renaissance man about school. And now he we had started, which we often do, started part-time and now he's working uh, 35 hours a week actually. Um, and went virtual when they were closed, but now that they're open, he's back in there. So um, yeah, <laughs> Gingy is, um, this is very important actually. Um, you know, you may get an individual who perhaps can shred, um, um, but wants to be a fireman. And so you get someone, you find a firehouse that needs someone that is going to shred. And that person will be thrilled to go to work every day. And Jinji is um, an athlete um, who loves to play basketball. But she's very focused and very detail-oriented, and she works... Um, at NBA store um, and she um, tags and does stockroom things and um, just make sure all the sizes are there. And she just, you know, as you can see from her face, this is like her dream place to exist. And I think that's really, we do that for ourselves. You know, if someone put me in an office all by myself, um, I think I would shrivel up. I'm a people person. And so it isn't just your talent and skill, but it's what what you love to do every day. And, um, and so that's, I think that's an important part of our matching um, for, uh, for our young people. Um, and and yeah. I think that that's something as a small business owner, I know that like, and I think this goes for most, most business owners, you're looking for employees who I uh, have a passion for the, an interest in the work that you do because you want to retain them. <laughs> you know, you want someone to grow with you and the same applies here. Um, there are some examples that you have of manufacturing businesses or businesses that are in production um, that, that, I mean, obviously we learned about uh, the gentleman that's doing more administrative and office work, which obviously all businesses need that kind of support. Um, but you have worked with different manufacturing businesses in New York City as well. Um, could you share a few of those examples? Sure, sure, absolutely. 
Um, I, I would also like to say that the work that is some individuals are doing may feel like minutia or just repetitive. Um, but if the person's in, an if that's the skill they have and you put someone in an environment where they'll thrive, then that is not a job to be um, concerned about. That's, you know, so, yeah. So this is um, Ray Kwan. Ray Kwan is an artist uh, who does very detailed work. And so he's beautiful hands. Um, and so it isn't as if he is in love with making lighting fixtures, but he gets great joy. You know, um, you may not have thought that that's something he would want to do, but he's been working many years at a lighting fixture place that makes, um, and you can see here that it's a great joy for him uh, to do very, very detailed work. Um, and yeah. So once again, it's it's another example of someone, um, yeah. And this is <laughs> this is Jake, um, the gentleman on the right, and his coach, um, Tim. And that is another thing that we um, we offer our um, job seekers and businesses. Um, we come each individual comes with a job coach, um, and really mostly to onboard that person. Perhaps they're extremely shy and wouldn't uh, feel comfortable knowing uh, to go to a supervisor to ask for something. Um, and so at the outset, when a person is on the job, we make sure that they um, are comfortable and, um, and then when they master it, then we fade away. So unless perhaps you'd like them to learn another position like James. So when he went to a different uh, part of the school, um, we came back and helped him on board there. Um, so Jake um, is just a sweetheart and he's actually working at Martha. Um, more important was the community of the place, the culture of the place, um, than the task itself. Um, he and um, so we, we sought out a Danny Meyer institution um, Danny Meyer, who owns um, many restaurants, including all the Shake Shacks, um, their um, culture is particularly engaged. You know, their um, their staff they they have a very deep, uh, warm camaraderie and respect for each other. That's that's part of their community. It's their whole um, uh, yeah philosophy and so he's worked um, there for now the last four years and he's just a sweetheart and doing very well so um that's that's we, it i think i think the key here is um that um as i say i'm just going to repeat myself is matching really and finding out what a business needs and matching the individual to that position yeah, and I, we don't have a photograph here to illustrate this, but um, Brooklyn Roasting Company is another company that I, I learned from you that in some cases they've had placements that are from another organization, like within your consortium, there are multiple people from different service providers right. that are right. in that necessary. Yeah. And yeah, and I don't think they necessarily even know that it's from different organizations because everyone is working under that customized employment strategy. Um, yeah, and actually Brooklyn Roasting has um, a young lady that's been there many years um, that is full-time in the fiscal department, also production, um, and also customer facing. Um, actually Colson as well, the bakery, had a person, now they've downsized, but I'm sure she'll come back. Um, so yeah, so we do work with them. And on that note, um, before we bring all of our panelists back on, um, uh, for our final kind of audience questions and, and final questions, um, how are things going with, uh, the, you know, in light of the pandemic, uh, and with COVID-19 and the, and the current situation that's affecting businesses across the city, uh, as well as I'm sure the individuals you serve, um, could you speak to us, uh, sure. uh provide us a little bit of a perspective on, on how that's going? Sure. I mean, I think there is um, a silver lining to this. Um, I think that actually customized employment is is really made for the moment. I think people are thinking out of the box and creatively, not necessarily as 
they might have thought they would, but as as need for need, I think budgets are stretched and the people need more part-time time people individuals for specific tasks. I think also the fact that uh, companies are pivoting towards uh, different kinds of work, production, um, masks or or making food in grab and go, um, et cetera. That's been actually a sweet spot for us. Um, most, many of our individuals, I mean, 60%, 70% of our individuals, like the city itself, you know, has been furloughed. But um, I'm happy to say actually only one out of them have um, had their job disappear. You know, the rest are growing, as things are opening up, they're coming back. Um, so that's been really good. But I, I have to say that, um, you know, there has been a positive dynamic now, a feeling towards community, a feeling, understanding a little more about the um, power and self-esteem that's directly relatable to work itself and how it does affect both, you know, the person, the, the family, the community. And I think that, that uh, you know, touches um, so much more than you would naturally have anticipated. And I think that so for people with disabilities, um, you know, work itself is, is so fundamental and empowering. Um, I think anyway, for during this time in COVID, I think, you know, it's, as we open up, we're getting back, but I've, we've been actually having feeling that it, this, that we're made for the moment, ironically. So. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it, it, what you mentioned earlier about, uh, social justice and your optimism for this moment. Um, we're, discussing, thinking a lot, including during this Made in NYC week about inclusion and um, inclusion of people with disabilities and ensuring that everybody can participate in our economy and in businesses um, is so critical and makes businesses more competitive. Um, if there is a business, in just a few words, if you could tell us if someone is interested, there's an employer out there that wants to work through this uh, customized employment uh, initiative, how might they get in touch? And um, yeah. I'd love to um, meet you and have a more personal conversation to see where we might be helpful and where you may need a need met. Um, and you can reach me on my email, which is kwaltuck at jobpathnyc.org. But I know that you have it in your website <laughs> um, for today's uh, discussion as, as with all for all of us. But yes, please reach out to us. We're on social media as well. And but get in touch with me and be absolutely delighted to continue the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. And we just dropped your email into the social media. So if people want to get in thank touch, you. please check the comments. Um, and you can also, of course, check uh, jobpathnyc.org. Um, and now I'd like to invite uh, all of our folks to come back on. Um, and uh, we're gonna have, uh, let's see if we have any audience questions. Now would be the time if you're watching on uh, Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, if you have questions, please type them in so we can see them. Um, and I, I guess I have a question of, well, I, I'd like to sort of tell everyone that the reason that we have a slide up the whole time is because uh, we want to ensure that there are captions for everyone uh, to make this as accessible as possible. And this is the best solution we could come up with. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your understanding. And um, so I, my question for, for all of you, and we have about eight minutes left. So in one or two minutes, um, if you could please uh, share, you know, like how has the work learned about your work? Uh, I think we're hearing someone typing. Um, if you could mute yourself for just a second, um, that would be great. Um, okay, how has your work informed your understanding or shifted your perspective uh, on what a more accessible and in inclusive future might look like um, for people with disabilities, with and without disabilities? Um, and, and so sort of as you think about the work that you're doing, um, how has it sort of opened your eyes to what the potential is in the future for inclusion of people with disabilities? Um, or if you'd rather, rather than thinking about society as a whole, if you'd rather respond within the context 
of your own business or organization and how you'd like to, within your own capacity, kind of help to realize a more inclusive vision? Like you can answer it in either way, but I, I'd just be interested in, in hearing your perspective on that. Um, uh, I don't know who would like to go first. Uh, we could go in reverse order. So Karen, would you like to share uh, like a minute or so sort of to close us out? Wow. Um, I mean, I mean, I can almost say that's why I love New York um, and the diversity, the, and that's why I think it's so creative and dynamic. I think it's because there are so many different types of people here. Um, I think there's actually 400 languages. And I think, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really optimistic for this progressive movement forward uh, societally that, um, that we will include everyone. And from that will come, uh, you know, where the, rising water, you know, lifts all boats. Uh, and I think also the more the awareness that disability is really part of the um, diversity, it's an integral part of diversity that it, it's, a, it's such a broad stroke, pro, you know, stroke, uh, it just includes everyone. Uh, and I think, I don't know, I just feel very positive about it and am and, and proud to be a part of this. And to see everyone here so uh, creative, uh, it's a great time. I mean, it's a great time. That's it that, <laughs> for us. And I'm proud to be part of it. Thank you. Su Suzanne, uh, Suzanne sure. from yeah, Undercamp? Yep, yeah. yeah, I'd love to answer that question. So I think what I'm seeing is there is much more authentic representation of disability. Um, so you see it in fashion. Um, in 2016, for the first time, there were wheelchairs uh, on Fashion Week on the runway. You see it in print ads. Um, so I think that's very exciting. And I think that there is now this idea that fashion, which has traditionally been very exclusive, is changing and a lot. And so it's opening up and it's becoming much more inclusive. And I think it's an exciting time. I agree with Karen. Absolutely. Thank you. And Sandra, would you like to share your reflections? Oh, oh, uh, we need you to unmute. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I can see you, but I can hear you, so that's okay. We um, can hear you, but we can't see you. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I think um, I'm agree with you guys. Um, I think that this is the perfect time. I think that people are getting a little bit more knowledgeable uh, about disabilities, and I think that people are opening up to help. So I think that people are doing their part. And I think that people with disability are gonna enjoy this because um, they're gonna have more opportunities out there. Yes, thank you. And I mean, what you're doing, you're really, all of these organizations are building community, um, which is so critical and important in the advancement of disability rights and also inclusion and access to whether it's products, spaces, activities, environments. Um, Tamara, um, if you'd like to kind of take us out with your reflection on this question. Yes, thank you so much, Cindy, and thank you everyone again for being here today. Um, really happy that I got to be a part of the conversation with you all. Um, for me, and I think for all of us at Adaptive Design, um, we always want to let everyone know that our mission and vision is that everyone belongs. Um, no one should be excluded from any environment. Um, in our organization, there is a space for everyone. Everyone has a way in which they can contribute 
And sometimes that just means uh, a simple adaptation to just change the space so that they can bring their best selves to the table. Um, and I think in addition, um, this current time that we are in, it has also um, showed us how vulnerable we all are, but also how strong we all are. And if we keep working together, um, I think we can make this world a much better place together. Absolutely. Um, thank, thank you so much to Tamara Morgan from Adaptive Design Association, San Alfonso from Adaptability, uh, Suzanne Leary Shoemaker, uh, CEO and founder of Undercare, and Karen Waltek, who is the director of the Consortium of Customized Employment at JobPath NYC. Um, for those of you that are interested in uh, adaptive design and uh, accessibility, um, our company can style tours during this time while we're doing a few outdoor in-person tours. Uh, we've pivoted almost entirely online. So after Made in NYC Week, we're hoping to do more of these kinds of programs and hopefully in partnership with our already existing partners like the Brooklyn Navy Yard as well as the Brooklyn Army Terminal um, and of course Made in NYC. So thank you so much, Joanna, for putting up the platform for including all of us in uh, this important programming this week that's really centered around social justice and social inclusion in New York City's manufacturing sector. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you so much thank for you. having thank us. You guys. Bye. 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 Thank you. Um, that was a wonderful conversation. I want to thank uh, Turnstile Tours. Um, before I let everyone go, I just want to let you know that uh, we have one more panel left for Made in NYC Week happening tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, it is called Manufacturing Pivots and Industry Resilience. So if you enjoyed uh, this conversation, that one will also be incredibly engaging um, and will highlight manufacturers in New York City who pivoted their production during the pandemic to answer the needs of New York City and to keep New Yorkers safe uh, and to stay resilient uh, in their industry. So I just wanted to close with that, tell you to tune into that as well. Um, thank you to Turnstile Tours and all the panelists for a really amazing, important, and really inspiring uh, conversation um, that, that gave me some hope for the future and how we're moving things forward. And you all are doing really amazing, amazing work. So thank you all and uh, have a great evening. See you all later. Thank <laughs> you.